the failure pattern is as a GPM, you will have meetings like dropped on your calendar at this time. Hello everyone, I'm Akash Gupta, 15 years in product management, most recently a group product manager at Affirm, the public financial technology company, and I'm really excited to tell you about the day in the life of a group product manager in fintech. Awesome. Well, welcome, Akash. I'm really excited to have you here and walk through this topic. And as you mentioned, we're going to be talking about what does that day in the life look like? And I know there's obviously a lot of variants, but we're going to try and do some justice to this topic here and give a snapshot for the folks that haven't been there before what this looks like. So um, why don't we go ahead and jump in? And you've given me a little bit of sense of what this calendar looks like. And it sounds like you start your day at about 830 with something called emails and Slack triage. So like, what, is, what does that entail? What does that look like? Give me, give me a little window into that. Yeah, as a PM, it's pretty important to show your team that you're on top of things, that you're not responding slowly. Like engineers should be getting unblocked. Designers should have questions answered. Analytics should know what they need to be working on. And so I always try to have a slightly earlier start than my team. And so that's where that 830 comes from. And then the second thing is I do the triage in the sense that I try to figure out what are those urgent things that I need to respond to? And then what are those important things that I need more time and I can put a calendar block later in the day or later in the week to actually fully address? And so my triage usually takes about an hour. And in the first 20 to 30 minutes, I just quickly crush through all the emails that I can and slacks that I can. And then for the last 30, I'll address like one or two of the more important ones that require a longer write up and try to get those done. Got it. Okay. And then tell me a little bit about like, what's an example of some email you might get where you're like, oh yeah, I need to do more thinking on that. I'm going to put a block on my calendar later today or later this week to do it. And then second part of that question is what's an example of some email or Slack message you might get where you're like, oh crap, you gotta like literally just clear my calendar for the rest of the day and deal with this because this is a mess. Yeah, it happens more often than you'd think in uh, the group product manager role is you hear from, for example, your analytics partner, our activation rate is down 10% week over week. And that's like a drop everything moment if that activation rate is your OKR. And yeah. It probably happens like once every two weeks that you really do need to go in and reorganize your day, take off some of the recurring meetings that we're going to talk about right now in order to focus on whatever that problem is. So that's what fits in that latter category. In the firm, former category of, hey, what is an email that I want to take a little bit more time on? It's generally, if you think about the two by two of urgent and important, yeah. it's those things that are important, but not urgent. Because if it's urgent, you want to go ahead and say something like, acknowledged CEO, I'm addressing this today and expect a response later. Yeah. But if it's not urgent, if it's your head of product asking you like what your big rocks are coming up next quarter, that's something you want to really thoughtfully present. You don't want to just hit him with some bullet points. You want to put the numbers behind it. You want to put your conviction level behind it and maybe like even a release month. And so that's something that you're going to want to organize into a beautiful little table that you can just send to him. And so that'll be something that I'll chunk out later and create over 15 minutes and then send. Got it. Okay. Makes, makes total sense. There's something that you mentioned in there that I think we're going to come back to later as well, which is big rocks. So I will, I'll put a pin in that and I want to come back to that. But it sounds like after this email Slack triage, your next sort of like on a default basis is like a set of weekly meetings that might take you from you know 930 to, to noonish. What are those key weekly recurring meetings that you're thinking about? So there are a variety of meetings that a GPM needs to be in that are recurring. But on this particular day, I have two really fintech specific meetings okay. and two very abstractable group product manager meetings. So in the fintech side, in fintech, meeting with legal and compliance is critical. You want to keep legal and compliance totally apprised of, hey, these are some new product features that we've added to our roadmap. These are how... Uh, features that are an experiment are performing. And then these are some of our finalized mocks. And so 
Unlike in other industries, in healthcare and in financial technology, you'll often see a GPM in this type of a meeting where they're actually meeting with legal counsel and they're debating tough issues. A lot of times what happens is one of the PMs on your team will be building a feature and from PRD to mocks that legal and compliance have had their hands on, the feature gets watered down. And so a lot of times what the GPM has to do is understand the root cause of the watering from legal and compliance and then help rework the feature with the team. And so a lot of those are like very nuanced debates about learning what the legal and compliance concern is. So that's meeting one that's FinTech specific. Meeting two is with risk and credit. So at a firm specifically, we're talking about a lending business. And so everything comes down to how tight is your credit box? What are yeah. the APRs that you're offering? And so if as a product team that's focused on activation, you're not focused on credit, you're going to miss a lot of things. In fact, like credit levers tend to move activation more than basic product levers. And so as a GPM, it's really important to proactively meet with this team. And for this meeting, I would have had had spent time yesterday to come up with a very impressive update to help them know that I'm really thinking critically about some of the things that we're doing in risk and credit. And then they would present on their side, hey, some of the features you launched, this is leading to lower quality users, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a very data-driven meeting. I'll yeah. pause there if you have any questions on those fintech meetings. Yeah, I mean, I think the the like the risk and credit thing is like particularly interesting in in the fintech world, and especially with the the nature of the business you worked at a firm. I, I imagine there's a lot of trade off of like, hey, like we can do this thing on the product side that's going to like boost activation, get people like signed up faster, or push more people through the funnel, et cetera. But you've got the other side of that, which is like, hey, now we've got a bunch of lenders potentially that aren't going to meet the credit profile, and they're going to like you know, our default rates are going to go up to a point that's unsustainable. And so I, I would imagine there's a lot of like give and take in that meeting and in, in terms of like thinking about what can we do and what's productive to do from the whole business perspective, not just like this will improve some product metrics. Yeah. And if you think about the way to be a product leader here, it's never to increase the default rate. And so that's why it's important to have this proactive conversation where you're saying something like, hey, the profile of the user that's coming in from my recent feature that graduated is X. What should be the products that they're eligible for that we should be recommending to them? And that way, if you're proactively managing the relationship with your key credit counterparts, they consider you like one of the easier product leaders to work with. Got it. Makes sense. Cool. So it's really like making sure you've got a good partnership and like open channels of communication there. 100%. Cool. And then tell me about the, you got two other meetings uh, on your, uh, on this block of your calendar that are more weekly, just recurring meetings that are, you know, not FinTech specific. What's the nature of those meetings? Yeah. So there's two really important meetings that occurred on this day. Day meeting one is my weekly meeting with my other three key leads. So the okay. group product manager, I have a team of, you know, five PMs under me. And I also have counterparts in engineering, design, and analytics who are group or director level folks. And keeping those four people aligned is probably one of the primary jobs of a group product manager. They should be going to the more senior engineering leadership, analytics leadership, and design leadership, and presenting your vision really proactively. The failure pattern is, hey, the head of design, they don't actually know what the direction was for this really dramatic change you made in the app. And so it's really critical to proactively as a product leader, prepare this meeting in the most sculpted way where you figure out the topics that people need to know about and also the topics where people might have some concerns. Maybe it's the case that analytics impact sized one of your initiatives pretty small and that's what the team is about to take on. You need to address that head on why you guys are working on it and make sure that that person is on board. And so that's the key purpose of that meeting. And then the second meeting is weekly business review. This is a famous Amazon tradition. And I think it's really effective in getting everybody to be metrics driven. So if you're on a product where you have enough metrics, if you're not a very early stage startup, then this is a really effective meeting, typically read, led by analytics, where they walk through, these are like the key metrics that we look at normally 
That's like part one. That's usually short. And then part two, these are the key changes, or here's a deep dive, or here's an opportunity area. And those are typically done with those four leads, but then also kind of the fanned out 20 people across the four disciplines that are working in the five pods. Got it. So you'd have like the reports you're saying for each like engineering, analytics, et cetera. What about any senior leadership attending that meeting and see it like seeing like, hey, what are the weekly metrics for, for this group doing? So product leaders occasionally drop in, analytics leaders occasionally drop in, um, and it depends, but on a weekly cadence, that might be too much to bring them into product analytics. On something like growth marketing, where there's more significant changes on a weekly basis, it makes sense. But in the product, like your big features, you're not going to be shipping gigantic features every single week. That's not sustainable. And so we would typically have like a larger metrics review in around our area, maybe like oh, on a monthly basis or even a quarterly basis with more senior leaders. Got it. And then what happens in one of those meetings? Like what? Give me a sense of like, what are some of the action items or takeaways that come out of it? Like if the analytics team says, hey, we're going to do a deep dive on activation rate and trends lately, how might that then translate into some action or work for you and your team? So part of it depends on the types of deep dives that they do. But to get really concrete, let's say they go ahead and identify that one of the key drivers of activation are these batch marketing emails and nobody in the room is represented from those batch marketing emails. And the amount of activations we got last week is down 25% from those batch marketing emails. Then we might assign a next step action item. Who's the right person in the room to go, go interface? And I would say like six out of 10 times, it's the PM. <laughs> and so in this <laughs> case, it would be me like, Yep. yep, action item for Akash to go check in with growth marketing team, figure out how we can make this more stable, maybe even increase the amount since we've now learned this new thing about how important it is. Yeah, got it. Okay, cool. Awesome. So what comes next in the daily schedule after, after you go through these set of recurring meetings? So the failure pattern is as a GPM, you will have meetings like dropped on your calendar at this time, but I, as much as possible, try to create a midday break. So like a focus time or a lunch. And I will often like be pretty aggressive with like proposing new time to folks if they're falling within my focus time. So need to go take a break, go outside, grab some sun. There's these studies that they did. I believe it was Harvard researchers. And they found that if you're sitting in like many back-to-back -back meetings, you can literally see the effect on your brain <laughs> in an <laughs> fMRI scan. And so it's, it's really important to just take a second. Like we're all about doing our best work, not the most work, right? In product management, we could do unlimited work. And so I need to walk the walk for my team and say like, hey, I'm going to take a little lunch. So usually what I do is I take an hour break. I like quickly make lunch eat it with whoever's at home. Since I work remotely, my son is often at home with the nanny. We'll have a quick lunch together. And then I'll use like the remaining time often for something out of the email Slack triage that I couldn't get. Or this day in particular, what I needed to do is send out a business update on our progress towards activation. And so I use this little time to quickly draft it up. We had just come out of our WBR metrics review. So I had a bunch of awesome charts I could put in there and I sent that out. Got it. And what's like for something like a business update, go a click deeper on that. Like who's the audience for that? Is that your VP? Is it the C staff? Like who's getting this update that you're, that you're putting together with some metrics about like, Hey, here's, here's the health of the product I'm working on. So it depends and it should be bespoke based on the email because you don't want to spam senior leaders. So I'll actually often write the update and then I'll think back to like, who is the plus one level of leadership across all of my XFN partners that I want to keep on top of. So at a firm, there was like a team called Marketplace. There was a sales team. There's customer success. There's all these different groups. And so I would look at like that list of say like 20 people and I'd decide like based on this week's update, eight of these 20 should be getting it. And the goal would be that on like a monthly basis or something like that, all 20 of them hear from me at least once because everybody likes to hear and feel like they're 
having a say in a, a critical area of the product. Um, and so I use this type of an update to drive that. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. And then it, it looks like next on the calendar, you've got some one-on-ones starting at like 1.30. So tell me about those. Yeah. I mean, as a manager, one of your most important meetings of your day is your one-on-ones with your direct reports. What I try to do so that I can be really prepared, really energetic and really stacked up against them is put like one or two in a day instead of just stacking them all five. And so in this case, I have one of the folks on my team and I'm going to be coming to them with some agenda items. The, what I don't like as a manager or being managed is like my manager just shows up and expects for the whole agenda. Like I will usually have either like something from their development plan where we're tracking progress, positive or negative, or really probably 70, 80% of the time, there's something that leadership or product leadership wants from this PM that wasn't so urgent that I'm going to bring it up at the one-on-one. -on -one. Like, hey, our CTO is really concerned about the amount of ML engineers we have on this model. So can you make sure to like double click and present a plan and have a meeting and invite me to it? So something like that. Yeah, got it. Okay. And then... Um... So you have got like sort of three ones listed. It was like engineering person on my team, and then thinking with someone from analytics. Tell me a little bit about like on the analytics component. Like, what does that relationship look like there? What are some of the key topics that are going to come up in like a recurring one on one? So yeah, this is happens to be a monthly one on one. But one of the most effective tactics, I think, for as a product leader, especially when you're in that middle management layer is to regularly meet with your counterpart's manager. So I have in that four key leaders meeting earlier in the day, met with my director of analytics, but at the same time, the VP of analytics, he's in the room when all of the key decisions are being made with the C-suite. And so making sure that he's apprised of our recent successes and the impact size of the current features coming up is really important to build that credibility and so that he can speak up for you when you're not there. So that's what that meeting is about. And I tend to meet like monthly with almost all my counterparts managers. The yeah. other meeting with my engineering counterpart is we already had a meeting earlier today, right? As a group of four, but we didn't have a one-on-one. -on -one. More building that personal connection, understanding what the problems are, giving each other feedback. And so that one-on-one -on -one is really a relationship building with kind of the most important counterpart I have, who's the engineering leader. Got it. And so that like one-on-one -on -one with your engineering leader, will that, will you go into that? Because it sounds like you're focused on relationship building there more than like tactical, like, hey, let's sit down and talk about feature X for this sprint or, you know, like this particular bug that's still like ongoing, that type of thing. You try and like leave that stuff for another discussion. Is that the right way of understanding it? I to create enough surface area that they don't feel like the one-on-one -on -one is where they need to surface that information. There may be a hot issue that both of us or one of us wants to talk about that's along those lines. But if you're not creating enough space in your one-on-one -on -one to have those more casual debates, get what's actually on their mind about how product is doing, then you're never going to hear that feedback until like 360 review time. And that's not never good. Got it. Okay. So it sounds like part of the intent is like, make sure you've got some like breathing room for just like building that rapport and getting issues out and discussing maybe, you know, bigger, but less urgent items that are relevant to your product area. Yeah, hundred percent. Like the bugs and the blockages, ideally those are done in like a weekly project meeting that that engineering leader is already leading. And so this is like a different purpose. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Um, what comes next? By this time have like 72 Slack messages, <laughs> like 15 emails because I've been in meetings and I've been doing focus time. And so I personally like to batch my communication period. So this is the second of three batches, which is kind of the afternoon batch. And it's often just like a calendar hold that I'll put on my calendar myself because otherwise people will put meetings onto it. Yeah. <laughs> and as I mentioned at the top, like responsiveness is a critical feature 
of a good product manager. And so this block is there to make sure people feel like they can come to me midday with an issue and I'll actually try to action it really quickly. So a lot of these messages will be beyond just like an okay or an acknowledged. And that's why I need the blocked focus time. I'll actually do something about the issue. You know, maybe um, one of my PMs messages me that we're gonna have a two week delay in our big rock feature. Now that's a big problem, right? And so I'll immediately go to them and say like, okay, like did we evaluate the alternative options? Is there, you know, a, a solution we could do if we gave you an extra engineer from another team? You know, I would actually come in with some very specific ideas yeah. to just help that person along. Got it, okay, cool, makes sense. And then it sounds like you've got a product review for what you've called the big rock. So I'd love to hear what, you know, tell us a little bit about like, what is this product review? And then also just for folks that may not know the term big rock, what is, what does that mean? Product reviews are probably the most stressful part of a PM's job, right? So you're doing a review of kind of your proof of work, which is your PRD, and you're doing it on a big rock, which typically in the planning process, you'll identify like, these are the two to three features that we think are gonna have the highest impact. And then for those features, as a result outcome of the planning process, senior leaders like the head of product, the head of engineering, even the CEO, depending on the size of the company are gonna be pretty interested in like, basically right before you go to building, can they give all their feedback? And so that's generally when the product review happens, like you had it on your roadmap, everybody okayed the roadmap, so they know it's coming. But what they wanna see now is like, what are the design mocks? What's your refined impact estimate now that you really went into the details and figured out which user flows are gonna get access to the feature versus not? What is the key risk area why this feature wouldn't hit its metrics? And so a product review is, really tough, both for the group product manager, because they need to work with their PM to really impress the product leadership to show that they have a strong team, but especially for that PM who's typically leading the meeting. And so I would have often had like a meeting the day before with my PM and said like, let's walk through, like, where are the key areas I can help? How can we help improve this presentation? And hopefully like a day before that, they would have actually sent me the document and I would have marked it up in one of my focus time email periods. Right, so you're trying to, to help him or her understand like, here's the nature of some of the questions, here's maybe something they're gonna press on. I know they're focused on this metric, like how is this gonna impact that? Like, it's sort of like a, you know, like a trial run, right? Exactly. And depending on how busy the PM has been, sometimes they might not have had time. Like maybe they had a bunch of other senior reviews that they needed to do. So they didn't have time. So sometimes that meeting might even just be like a working meeting where we're jamming on. Okay. I think like we need to reorganize the doc structure to put this at the top. Like, okay. I think that what the doc is missing is like some really pointed discussion questions. Let's add those, that type of thing. Got it. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and then let me let me ask, like, I think you sort of alluded to this, but I'll, I'll ask uh, specifically, what's the audience in a product review? Like, who is, who is yourself and your, a PM on your team generally presenting to? Obviously, there's going to be some variance company to company and whatnot, but. So at a company that has 2000 people, like a firm, generally, it'll be like my manager, my skip level, okay. which would be like a director and VP of product the design manager. So it'll be like a senior director of design. Yep. Um, and then potentially product leaders who are impacted by the change we're making. Because rarely does a product change just impact one area. Yeah. So there might be a couple other directors of product. And so those become like the most important. Depending on the org, there might be a senior director of engineering or senior director of analytics who really cares about this stuff. But a lot of times they're pretty busy as well and that's not their main focus. So it tends to be like product and design leaders. Got it, okay, cool, awesome. So I think we're at, uh, let's see, five o'clock now. We're basically at the end of the day this year but there's a few other things on the agenda. So so take us home, what's, what's left? Yeah, unfortunately being a group product manager is not a 40 hour a week job. Um, <laughs> so from five to 5.30, a practice I've really found important for me is planning the next day. 
And the reason I find this important is it allows me to like actually close my day. Otherwise I feel like this overriding anxiety about all the other things that I need to do. But if I can confidently tell myself, okay, I'm going to work on this and this thing tomorrow or this week or next Thursday, that really helps. And so I tend to use this as kind of like my cool down sign off period and figure out like what is important and urgent to do tomorrow. Got it. Okay. And then it sounds like there is one last thing on the agenda, right? You've got 930 blocked off that I can see. Uh, catching up on messages. Tell me more about that. Yeah, we live in a remote world. I live on the East Coast and <laughs> my colleagues are still working until, you know, nine Eastern. And going back to the very top, like as a PM, if you're one of those PMs who's responding to your colleague, like the next day, like you're just losing an opportunity to build credibility, build responsiveness, show them that you really care. And so I tend to find time at the end of the evening to once again do the final clear out of my email and Slack. And at this time, like a lot of times I'll be doing it out of pocket. I won't even be on my laptop. I might be on the exercise bike or I might be going for a walk or something like that. And so a lot of times the messages will be like, hey, James, thanks for sending me this message. I'm going to check it out tomorrow type of thing. But yeah. that level of responsiveness helps build that expectation also from your colleagues that they respond to you that quickly and builds that credibility that you really care. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and also in a case like that, that example, you're acknowledging like, Hey, I got this. I saw it. Here's when I'm going to get to it. So they have some certainty if they're trying to plan other things, understand when feedback is going to come or, you know, review or whatever the case may be that type of thing. Yeah. Cool. Well, this, this was great. I feel like we've got a very thorough run through of what a day might look like and some of the sort of the ins and outs and um, how things work between sort of tactical stuff like email, Slack triage, all the way down to a product review for, as you said, big rock, like a big, you know, sort of foundational feature of maybe your quarterly roadmap or something like that. So thanks yes. for running us through it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.